we're taking a look at parks big and small on this special edition of City Stream. From a nature program that brings out the child in all of us, Quack! to a new kind of park that offers a unique twist on the open space concept. That seems like a very Seattle type thing to have, so. These stories and more are coming up on this episode of City Stream. Hey everybody, welcome to this edition of City Stream. I'm Cameron Wong and this week we're at Discovery Park, a great place to learn about nature and the environment even on a cold day. We'll tell you a little bit more about that later on. But if you want to know a little bit more about nature, a great place to start is at a city park and through a volunteer naturalist. Jeff Yeager introduces us to some of these volunteers and how they show their love of nature through some very young explorers. Penny Rose is never alone when she walks in the woods, partly because nature is one big classroom. <laughs> this is actually a Rufus hummingbird. Rose is a public education program specialist who says there's a lot to learn about hummingbirds. Did you know, for instance, that they fly from Seattle to Mexico every year? If you are a hummingbird, one of the reasons that you could fly that far is because you can beat your wings 60 times a second. Do you think you can do that? Let's try it. Ready? On your mark, set, go. Stop. Did you make it? <laughs> We're going to migrate south. Ready, set, go! Quick! She loves acting like a kid because that's who she's training these Seattle volunteer naturalists to reach, kids. I hear some nut hatches calling us. It must be safe to go. It must be safe to go. These adults are pretending that they're first and second graders today, students who will come through places like Discovery Park to learn. Others gather together in a flock just like this because the hope is that Gary gets eaten and I don't. Penny Rose is basically teaching the teachers. Might be a good thing for a bird to eat, huh? This program offers the opportunity to people from all walks of life, any background, to come here and to be trained. Little harvestman. It's a training that starts in the spring where they learn the pond and beach habitats. And in the fall, they learn the forest habitat as well as spider programs and bird programs and stewardship. And then they take that knowledge that they've gained um, about the wildlife and the plants and, and the song sparrows that are singing in the background and um, the interpretive skills that they give them. And the volunteers then take that knowledge and skill and they teach school programs as well as public programs. She says they have geologists, retired judges, physical therapists. The volunteer naturalists, it can be anybody, any walk of life. You don't have to have any background in sciences or natural history or education. We, we will take anybody from anywhere and because we give them everything we need. That's part of the reason why the program is so intense uh, is because we assume that everyone comes in with no background knowledge at all. People like Jeff Rallman. My conception was always, you know, the wilderness is out there and this is just a city park, but that was wrong. The Seattle Parks Department is looking for anybody with a thirst for sharing knowledge about nature. And if you share that with others, they say, we can, and this may sound a little corny, make the world just a little better place to live. We breathe better. Uh, I think it makes us happier. I think it makes us more sensitive towards uh, others, be they little birds or people or what have you. And I think it's important for people to not be in front of their computers and inside all the time. Hey, my name is Kevin, Kevin Choi, and I'm a textile designer. That is when Kevin's not a volunteer naturalist. What does he get out of the program? Everything. I, I learned so much about Seattle, all the parks, the plants, the animals. Um, I loved nature. They're maple seeds. Who can find a maple tree for me around here? Right, exactly. America's original naturalist, Henry David Thoreau, said he went to live in the woods because he wished to live deliberately. He might have volunteered for a program like this. He would have enjoyed people like Penny Rose, who's never alone when she's out in the woods, too many geologists, judges, physical therapists, friends learning from her, and so many others who sing to her. 
Does everyone hear the birds that are talking to us right now? Well, volunteer naturalists go through 10 weeks of training and they must commit to one year in the program. To find out more about how you can volunteer, check out our website at seattlechannel.org slash citystream. When CityStream returns for our park special, the newest open space is coming to a neighborhood near you. But this city park may not be where you expect to find it. CityStream, we'll be right back. Are you on the go? Then take CityStream with you. Log on to seattlechannel.org or iTunes to sign up for podcasts of every CityStream episode. Then download them to your mobile device and you'll never miss a show. Well, city parks come in all shapes and sizes. Discovery Park would be considered Big Park, about 534 acres, and it has everything you're looking for, open spaces, forests, and of course, beaches. Well, now there are some open spaces that are about the size of a parking spot. That's because they used to be a parking spot. Nicole Sanchez introduces us to the city's pilot program, Parklets. So here is the parklet, very autumn parklet with lots of leaves. This is the city's very first parklet. It used to be a parking spot, but now it's been carefully converted into a mini public park on Capitol Hill that also includes bike parking. So you've got parking for about six bikes or so. The parklet, located on East Olive Way outside of the Montana Bar, opened on September 18th. And the structure is unique because it also includes room for an outdoor cafe. There's two sides to the parklet. The west side is a sidewalk uh, cafe. So you can have a cocktail purchased at Montana in the cafe. The east side is the parklet. So this is a public space. This is a city park. The owners of the Montana bar will soon be adding tables and chairs to the cafe side and plan to share the space during the day with their neighbors, which includes a bakery. So those signs are on both sides and then we have some brochures about the program just to share information. Even though the east side is now a public park, the entire structure was paid for by the sponsors of the parklet, the Montana Bar, who will also be responsible for maintaining it. That's how the parklet program works. Everything, including the design, materials, construction, and upkeep are paid for by the parklet sponsor, not the city. And for Montana Bar, there was a lot of thought put into it. We wanted to create a structure that can be here for 30 years, so something really sturdy and well-engineered and well thought out that would be safe for all of our guests that wouldn't be an eyesore. Seattle's pilot program is modeled after a very successful parklet program in San Francisco, where they have over 40 parklets. The goal locally is to create more vibrant public spaces and to provide opportunities for communities to better connect. A parklet's really just a, a small space it's part of the right-of-way. It's a place where people can have a cup of coffee, meet friends, read the paper, just stop for a little bit and, and have a moment out of, out of the way of things. The other two parklets, part of the pilot program, are going to be built here in Belltown in front of the City Hostel Seattle on 2nd Avenue and here in the International District in front of the Oasis T-Zone on 6th Avenue South. People use the parklet all day long. The owners of the Montana Bar say they've had lots of positive feedback about sponsoring the new parklet, even though it takes up a parking spot. And that's something the city is looking at very closely with the pilot program. What we feel is that the conversion of one on-street parking space into a public open space is a really significant amenity. And it is not something that has a significant impact on the parklet supply or on people's ability to provide parking. And if all goes well, this pilot project could turn into a permanent one. But it's up to residents and businesses to decide if converting a few parking spots into new mini parks is the right move for Seattle, something this Capitol Hill resident agrees with. I think it's great. I think it's great to have a little more public space in the area. I think it's nice, you know, especially on a busy street. It's like, you know, narrow sidewalks, good place to sit, you know, have a cup of coffee, meet up with people. I think it's, I think it's a good thing for the community. Well, the other two parklets should be done by the end of the year, and park leaders will get the feedback of business owners and residents on whether or not to move forward with the parklets program. For more information, check out our website at seattlechannel.org slash citystream. Still to come, 
or exploring parks in a new series. There's one spot you might want to check out this weekend. But first, we'll check in at the Discovery Park Environmental Learning Center. Well, little did you know that Seattle's largest park, Discovery Park, actually has an indoor educational center. To tell us a little bit more about it, Jeff Rallman, a Seattle naturalist volunteer here. What exactly is that? Well, the Seattle Volunteer Naturalist Program began actually about two years ago. Uh, before that, there were docents here at Discovery Park for about 17 years. And then two years ago, it went citywide. So now what happens is anybody in the city who wants to come and get training to be a volunteer naturalist, um, can come here and do that. We do it in the spring and in the fall, and then they can go out to different parks. Is it just a easy sign-up process? or You need to fill out forms and then come for an interview and see your availability and that kind of thing because there's two ways you can do it. You can either teach during the week for school groups or do it on the weekends um, for classes of adults or manning stations, we call them, where you're just out in the park somewhere and answering questions. Uh, tell us a little bit about the educational center. What kind of things can people come and see here? Um, well, the displays you can see here of what's going on right now this, this season about the mushrooms and that. Um, this area in here has uh, various um, things for kids to take a look at. There's also another kids uh, play area in here with a lot of uh, nature items in it. And then we have a variety of programs here that go on. We do usually do introductions to programs here and then take people out in the woods. Discovery Park, obviously the biggest park. Uh, what are some of the hidden gems that just people just don't know about? Probably the first thing I would say would be a place called Wolf Tree Nature Trail. Mm -hmm. It's up at the uh, north end of the park, right by the north parking lot. And it's the greatest concentration of native plants anywhere in the park. Might be anywhere in the city, because um, they were planted a number of years ago by one of the uh, a volunteer type person who was interested in that. Mm -hmm. um, they've also just done some new landscaping there. They, did a, they daylighted a, a creek that was up there. So there's a lot of beautiful new plants and water flowing through that area. So it's right, if you go to the north parking lot, um, you'd be able to see that kind of thing. That's the first thing that comes to my mind. What about wildlife? What kind of animals can people see? Lots of birds. <laughs> <There's>, <laughs> the habitat here has gotten better and better over the years with planting more natives. So all kinds of birds come through here, migration, and then also a lot of birds that just inhabit this. And then the usual suspects in the woods, raccoons and squirrels. We occasionally get a coyote coming through here, uh, that type of thing. We have something called the mountain beaver. People might not have heard of. It's actually not a beaver. It doesn't live in the mountains. It's a burrowing <laughs> animal, and um, they're all over the park. Yeah. Trouble is they're nocturnal, so you don't often get to see them. Okay. Uh, your favorite area, your personal favorite area in the park? I'd have to say two things. Either the forest, which is in the north end. If you walk the loop trail, the forest is just beautiful there. And the other one would be out in the south meadow overlooking the, the sound and looking out towards Bainbridge and the mountains. Those would be my two favorite spots. Jeff, thank you. For more information on the Educational Center, check out our website at seattlechannel.org slash citystream. We'll be right back. Are you ready for heavy winds? Keep a flashlight, radio, and batteries handy in case of power outages. Report outages and stay clear of downed power lines. Keep grills and generators outdoors. The fumes are deadly. For more tips and checklists, go to takewinterbystorm.org. Well, here on City Stream, we love going out to the parks all around Seattle. Only fitting that we launch a new series highlighting our beautiful open spaces. We kick things off as we introduce you to a park that you probably haven't heard of, although it does have one heck of a view. We're here at Jack Block Park, which is just right adjacent to Harbor Island.
Well, we do call our parks uh, Seattle's hidden gems on the waterfront, and there's uh, this is one of uh, two dozen parks that we have um, that we uh, maintain on a regular basis. Like a lot of our parks at the Port of Seattle, they're former industrial sites, and we're actually standing on a former creosote plant. Uh, when we had purchased it, it was uh, with the idea to, to clean it up and turn it into a, an area that the public could, um, could enjoy throughout the year. Jack Block Park is named after one of the Port of Seattle's longest serving commissioners, Jack Block, who was elected in 1972. He was a longshoreman and crane operator that worked the terminals that you can see from the observation deck at this park. The view is uh, deliberately put there so people can see what the port does on a day-to-day -day basis. Cargo coming into the Port of Seattle, cargo moving out of the Port of Seattle. It's a, it's a great education as to what uh, a large chunk of this city does on a daily basis. This is one of the few ports, major ports in the United States, if not the world, that's situated right at the front doorstep of a major urban area. Also very unique to Jack Block Park is the pier and walkway area that we have that people can go out and that gives them also another just uh, you know completely great view of the downtown and the waterfront from there as well. It's a totally unparalleled view of, uh, of Seattle's downtown skyline. People are really able to do whatever they uh, would like to enjoy in a, uh, in a public park. Lots of kayaking, um, windsurfers sometimes. It's one of our few parks that has beach access. You can see a lot of the toys and amenities are uh, maritime based, you know, whether they be buoys or uh, uh, halyards that uh, used to be for where uh, ships would tie up. And so we've really wanted to maintain the maritime aspects of this park. And this is a great place to, uh, to come, take your kids. With 15 acres, it allows any kind of groups or any kind of activities uh, that the public wishes to enjoy. Uh, plenty of great waterfront access, and we welcome the public here from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. every day. For more information on Jack Block Park, check out our website at seattlechannel.org slash citystream. Or if you have a park you want to tell us about, shoot us an email or hashtag us citystream on Twitter. We'll be right back. Your city, your stories on CityStream. Fighting robots and golfing hot shots, picture-taking cats and stylish hats, exploring the beach and delicious treats, silver bowls and painting walls, bicycle cops and Seattle-grown crops, SUPs and urban trees, city bees and jogging dogs, historic halls and pickleballs, baby seals and cheap deals. Your city, your stories on City Stream. Thursdays at 7 p.m. on Seattle Channel 21 at any time on seattlechannel.org. Before we go, here's what's coming up next week on City Stream. It's Seattle's largest river, the Duwamish. We're taking a look at the rich history of this region and what the city is doing to clean up years of industry and pollution. Plus, meet some residents along the waterfront who are taking action into their own hands. Well, that's it for this week's show. Hope you've enjoyed the special on Seattle Parks. If you'd like any additional information on any of the stories you've seen, check out our website at seattlechannel.org slash citystream. And don't forget to hit us up on Facebook and Twitter as well. Tell us about the parks you love. I'm Cameron Wong. We'll see you next time.